All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for being here in the Carbon Pavilion on Tuesday. I'm glad to see a good crowd here. It's late enough in the morning that you've all gotten over all party central that happened last night. I hope you all had a good time. I hope you've seen some good papers. And I have to say, from my experience, I don't know what I was expecting this year at the SEG, but it's been a good crowd. And we've had a lot of traffic at our booth. For those of you who paid for that, I hope you're having the same experience. We're here a little bit today to talk, we're here today for a little bit, to talk about geophysical tools for measurement, monitoring, and verification of CO2 sequestration. Now, if you've walked around, if you've gone to any of the papers, heck, you're here. You know that the geophysical industry is kind of changing or has woken up to the opportunities that exist outside of oil and gas. Well, necessity is the mother of invention, and with the collapse of the oil and gas business, shucks, we looked around. And, you know, when I started microseismic ink, I said, I'm going to do everything except frack monitoring, because other people do frack monitoring. Within three years, I wasn't doing anything except frack monitoring. So how did I explain that? I said, well, when the market talks to you, you damn well better listen. And the market is talking to us as geophysicists, and we're listening. We're finding out that there are other things that we can do to put food on the table and pay the mortgage. And one of those is to participate in this CO2 sequestration business. So what I'm talking about here is, is nothing that's going to be new to any one of you, and I kind of want to make it interactive at all, if I can, because I'd like to sort of go through what I see are the problems that people have in doing monitoring and verification of CO2 sequestration, the geological problems, and try to see where we can plug in geophysics. And this is just my sort of stream of consciousness, and I'd be absolutely happy if I'd forgotten something, if you'd shout out, well, Duncan, you should have said this or that, or put that into your thinking. So I'm going to skip these first two slides because they told me yesterday that I talked too long. And, and, and it's those of you who know me know that that's probably easy to understand. Even though I'm Canadian and talk fast, I'll probably talk too long. So I'm going to skip the, the first two slides because they were entirely redundant. What I want to first say is that in my understanding of how we approach this problem, we can parse the geological problems into three time frames. There's before injection, when you are trying to anticipate where your weather, where you want to put the CO2 as a good place. There's during injection, where you worry about what's happening as you're sticking the CO2 in the ground. And there's after injection, that long period of time where you need to make sure the CO2 is staying in the ground. After all, the government says they'll take back your tax credits if they ever find out that the CO2 escapes. So we need to first see where we have the opportunities to contribute to helping our clients find out if this is a good place to do it. And to do exploration, we love exploration, to do exploration for the right kinds of reservoirs to put CO2. Then we need to monitor during and, and after. The marvelous thing about this business, folks, and I know you already understand it, is that unlike oil and gas wells, where the geophysical participation is for a few months, or fracking, where it might be a few weeks or days, this is a lifetime business. This is Warren Buffett's toll bridge. If you get involved in a real project, then it'll go on for years, injection for maybe 20, 30 years, and then after that, for the rest of your life, the rest of the century, the rest of all time making sure that the CO2 stays in place. So, before injection, you don't want to spend a lot of money putting money into an area that you then can't use. One of the things that you need to, to understand is whether or not there is enough capacity in that reservoir for you to inject over that 20 to 30 years, for you to be able to put those millions of, of uh, tons of CO2 away. Now, interestingly enough, the S SPE has put together a committee that has talked about making this capacity very much like your understanding of reserves. And they're talking about it in terms of probabilities, proven, probable, and possible. Hey, Larry. Proven, possible, and po anyway, capacity. And that resonates very well with how we've done our exploration all these years. So this is nothing new to any of us. And I would recommend that you look up the SBE, you go to their site and you look up about the SRMS system and how they're starting to quantify. It's very early days about them quantifying contingent 
capacity. It's very early days about them understanding the economics of it. I don't think any of us understand the economics, except to say that it is uneconomic at the present time. But it, that's a good resource for you to understand how we're assessing storage potential. And then there's the idea of active faults. You do not want to get involved with a property that is seismically active. Well, the government's probably not going to let you. But it would be good to get out in front of that and try to assess whether or not there's any active seismicity in the area before you start applying for your Class 6 permit. Now, once you've got that Class 6 permit and you start to inject, the number one thing that, that the community is going to be concerned about is whether or not you're going to create earthquakes while you're injecting. It's a bad word, earthquakes, and certainly everybody's concerned that if you start to see microseismic events and eventually they build up to the point where there is an, an event that's felt at the surface, you're likely to lose your license to practice. So we need to watch all the time to be able to anticipate and mitigate any of that. Then is the cap rock maintaining its integrity? The seal, if the seal gets broken by some of these movements of the faults and fractures, you might have the escape. Is the CO2 plume distribution staying in the storage reservoir? Well, you're going to want to know how fast you're filling up that system. Plumes, plumes. People talk about these plumes as if they're the surface of a balloon that's spreading out in terms of inside the reservoir. But we know, as geologists, that that's not the way it's going to be. It's going to finger into the areas of high permeability. It's going to move out at different rates and different places across the reservoir. We need to see where that's happening. And finally, has the CO2, any of it, leaked up above the seal? Because if it has, you're going to have a problem with the government and your tax credits. And then finally, after injection, and this is where it gets to be money in the bank just forever, you have to watch that thing to make sure that none of those previous problems are happening. That your cap rock is still staying there, that your fluid is still staying in the reservoir, and that nothing's leaking up above. Well, what are the geophysical tools off the top of my head, what are the geophysical tools that contribute to this? Well, before injection, to map the storage potential. This is easy for us. We've been doing this for, well, I was going to say centuries, no, decades. We've been mapping reservoirs with 2D and 3D seismic, drilling wells into them, anticipating or estimating what the porosity and permeability is, and doing a structural map and a, and a, and a volume map for the reservoir. We know how to do that and the engineers are going to help us quantify that. Are there active faults in or near the target reservoir? Well, the USGS and other seismologists have been putting out systems for decades. You all know about Bigfoot, how it traversed the country. We have an idea of where the seismically active areas in the country are. Sometimes that changes. Look at West Texas now, the most seismically active area in the country. It used to be the San Andreas. We know, though, where those seismically active faults are for the most part, or we know how to find them. How do we do it? Passive seismic. Passive seismic is the key tool. And then below that, uh, I don't know, somebody maybe put these in. These are kind of geochemistry. But we want to set a baseline for these observations before we start injecting so that if something changes, we will know that there's probably escaping CO2. Getting that baseline an important step. Did I forget anything? Michelle? No? Okay? All right, I'm going to move on. Is drawing injection? Well, primary. Are we likely to create any induced seismicity? We know from our work in the fracking world and the injection world that if you start to see micro seismic events growing in size, if you see them aligning along what you think is a pre existing fault, then you're likely to induce some seismicity. You need to raise your hand and say, we might be getting an earthquake there. So, micro seismic in order to monitor for induced seismicity. And then maybe, maybe active seismic to see if you can identify any faults that are moving. I don't think there's a lot of potential there. I don't think the value proposition is there to do active seismic, to look for induced seismicity, but I needed to put it up on the board. Cap rock, maintaining its integrity, again, micro seismic. If the cap rock breaks, snap, crackle, pop, you're going to hear those little movements on the faults and fractures. And you need to do it with micro seismic because they're going to be small and you need early warning. Active seismic to see movement in the, in the cap rock? Well, if you can detect it with active seismic, it's probably too late for you. You need to see it before that. How is the distribution changing? I think tool, primary tool number one is active seismic. 3D. People are saying, well, I want to do it with 2D lines. Why are they saying that? 
because they don't want to pay the price for 3D. We went through this, folks, about three, 30 years ago. We know, Bill French proved, the 2D seismic is what? It's always wrong. But we never learn. People are going to do 2D seismic because it's cheap. I am, well, I think I have a solution for that, but active seismic is going to be the way that you're going to track that plume because of the change in impedance. But electromagnetic methods have a, have a foothold there too because when you put the CO2 in, you're going to change the conductivity of that fluid in the reservoir. And maybe, maybe EM techniques, apart from the resolving capability, maybe EM techniques are going to be a better tool to use to track the plume. Microgravity, I read about it. I know that there's been some papers given this week about it. The response is small. The noise is large. I'm not sure the value proposition is there. Direct resistivity tomography, sure, it works. You can see the change in conductivity, but you map small areas just between the wells. DAS and DTS at the, at the injectors, really good to see where the stuff's going into the reservoir, but not much value beyond that in terms of away from your injection well. Offset drilling through the plume. Well, that's just exactly what I want to do. I want to put a hole in my cap rock so that things will leak out. Yeah, I can see the CO2 is here, and now it's coming back up my well bore. Not a good idea, folks, I don't think. Did I miss anything? Okay. Has the CO2 leaked into the shower? Well, you can do these geochemistry things above and compare it to your baseline. You can do temperature, DTS, drill a well, vertical well above the cap rock, sense the impedance, the, the gas coming in and it'll change the temperature. Micro seismic monitoring, again, I think as the, if the gas does come up above, it'll, you'll hear it, and I'm going to show you where we heard a leak in the tire. And then you've got active seismic, I don't think that's going to see it. CSEM, Kurt Strack tells me that an anomaly is going to be too small, so don't go looking for the, for the CO2 above the cap rock with that. And then microgravity, maybe, direct resistivity tomography, if you know where the leak already is and you can put a well around it. All right. After, well, it's all of the same tools. My time's running out, so I'm going to skip that. It's all of the same tools for all of the same reasons. And folks, it goes on forever. So it's a wonderful contract to have to be able to monitor forever. All right. So what about micro seismic? In each one of those categories, I've said to you that micro seismic or passive seismic monitoring has a real role to play. And our attempt to approach that market has been through buried arrays. We've been doing buried arrays since 2008. These were largely directed to doing life of field monitoring while you fracked well after well after well. But applying these to the life of field monitoring for passive seismic or micro seismic activity in a CO2 field, I think is spot on. The value proposition, yes, we can mitigate the seismic hazard before by using this array to detect any seismicity, existing seismicity in the area. You probably put a small array in because if you do have seismicity, you're going to write it off. During the injection, to listen for small micro seismic events if your cap rock breaks, perfectly well posed problem. And then tracking the injection fluids, not so well posed. But we'll talk about that just a little bit. So what do these buried arrays look like? We use a shot hole rig, we drill them down maybe 300 feet below the ground. We put multi-component phones in at different levels. You can see them over there on the left. At the top, we put in a, an a, a mast, an antenna that gathers the data 24-7, feeds it back to our, our processing center where we can do an analysis of all the micro seismic data that we hear. It works like this. We have our buried array, it goes up into the cloud. Hopefully we get the same stuff back. We put it, we have sort of an automatic processing, AI, ML based, that looks for anomalies that we need to raise our hand about. Plus we do long-term analysis to see if there are any trends in the data. What we deliver is a catalog of events, both individual events and acoustic emission over time that are indicative of the potential for inciting earthquakes, the potential for breaking of your cap rock, and maybe where the plume's going. Hello. And we use a stoplight system. I think Shell invented this in their work in Columbia, but Zobac has got a lot of press on it where it's easy. Green, you tell the client, don't worry, you can go to bed at night. Yellow, well, you should be worried a little bit. We need to do some more work. Red, you should stop injecting and go figure out what you've done wrong. 
I want to show you this one. This was a, an event, the very first project that MicroSeismic ever did, and it happened to be a CO2 project, where a client was injecting CO2 up in Wyoming in a field. They were injecting it just below this level, which was 2,600 feet. So it even has to be 800 meters. They were using it for EOR. They were getting CO2 at the surface, little hot pots. And they wondered, where's this CO2 originating? So we set out an array on the surface. It was not a buried array. About a square mile, 900 stations. We listened for a couple of weeks, and we saw three events. This is one of those three. This is a 30-minute time-lapse collapse of acoustic emission. And that in that 30 minutes, we saw this hot spot acoustically, a loud noise develop. The noise went upwards until it hit the level of the cap rock. And then my interpretation, it went sideways until it found a weak spot in the cap rock and it leaked out, the tire hissed, the tire went flat and the whole system collapsed. We saw three of those during this period of time. Now, this was the first project, it was our first CO2 project, it was also our last. Because the lawyers for this company said, what the hell are you doing providing evidence that we're leaking CO2 to the surface? And we were shut down. Fortunately, fracking came along and we went into that business. Well, I just want to say that this concept of us putting in buried arrays for long-term monitoring has gotten traction with the DOE. We received a grant to take our buried array technology and turn it into a tur turnkey service for CO2 sequestration monitoring. We're in the design phase now. By next spring, we should be deploying one of these systems on one of the carbon safe projects. I mentioned, I just want to mention in passing, tracking the fluids. I don't think we're going to hear the pressure front, if you like, of this plume advancing. I think we might hear the snap and crackle as we lubricate some faults, maybe. But probably the two ways that our buried array can contribute to this problem is one, having a fixed receiver array for 4D seismic. We'll use our receivers, get rid of changing receiver footprint, and get rid of the need to redeploy every time you want to do another phase. I think that will knock a lot of cost out of the system. And secondly, I'm suggesting that using this idea of EM is a good thing to do that we can, and we're actually partnering with Kurt. He's Kurt Strack. He's already done the baseline survey up in Tundra. We're hoping to build on that using a CSEM approach. And Kurt has a paper about that Tundra project on Thursday if you want to go see how CSE was applied. And I'm 2 minutes 43 seconds over time. We have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you for your time. Joe.